Jesus is King. Welcome to the One Peter Five podcast, rebuilding Christendom, restoring Catholic culture and tradition. I'm Timothy Flanders, the editor of One Peter Five. I'm joined today by my good friend, Eric Ibarra. Eric, how you doing, brother? I'm doing excellent. I'm even better now that I'm here with you. Yeah, man. Hey, this is this is great. It's always good to talk to you. Eric and I have known each other for years. I, I think you're probably my oldest internet friend that I've actually met in person a couple times. <laughs> yeah, I know. Uh, I remember that. We started talking on the phone pretty, pretty quickly. <laughs> yeah, I don't know when. Uh, I, I was going to ask you because our topic today is the filioque. And I couldn't even remember when it was that we started talking about Eastern Orthodoxy and everything like that. Was it like 2014, 15, something like that? years ago yes yeah, somewhere somewhere around 2014 it was definitely you know about a year into uh the pontificate of pope francis okay so somewhere around 2014 uh so eric has been studying this topic for something like going on eight years now yeah, um, something and like he's that. he's written a book about all of his studies the filioque mm -hmm. Revisiting the doctrinal debate between Catholic and Orthodox. So this is a doctrinal debate about the nature and person of the Holy Spirit. And the nature of this topic is not only very complicated, it's also very uh, awesome in the, in the sense of awesome, awe, uh, reverence, something that we should bring to this whole discussion because we're speaking about the all-holy trinity. So we're going to start with a prayer. We'll, we'll start with the the uh, Greek Catholic prayers uh, that are the normal prayers for uh, beginning the liturgy and the Trisagion. So we'll just pray this and then we'll just get into our topic. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. O heavenly King, the Comforter, the Spirit of Truth, who art in all places and fillest all things, Treasurer of blessings and Giver of life, come and abide in us and cleanse us from every stain and save our souls. O good one. Holy God, holy mighty, holy mortal, have mercy on us. Holy God, holy mighty, holy mortal, have mercy on us. Holy God, holy mighty, holy mortal, have mercy on us. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, now and ever into ages of ages. Amen. O Holy Trinity, have mercy on us. Lord, cleanse us from our sins. Master, pardon our iniquities. Holy God, visit and heal our infirmities for thy name's sake. Lord, have mercy, Lord, have mercy, Lord, have mercy. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, now and ever into ages of ages. Amen. Amen. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but to the verse from evil. Amen. Through the prayers of our holy fathers, Lord Jesus Christ, our God, have mercy on us and save us. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay, now we can begin uh, this topic. It's It's... I, I hate talking about this topic to a degree because of the nature of of the issue. Um, it's so complex, but it's also just such a uh, it's an ineffable thing to even talk about. But nevertheless, it is something that we need to talk about. So the reason we are discussing this at One Peter Five, um, our online journal is not really directed towards the Orthodox. Uh, it's really for Catholics. That's really our readership, but. Uh, we identify various errors or traps that Catholics could get into. And one of these is the Greek schisms, one of the three Greek schisms. There are three of them. Um, and the reason that we're trying to get deep into it in this show, we're trying to present uh, what Eric has brought out in his research, um, which is going more to the depths because there's a lot of sort of shallow polemics out there. And I'm going to share in just a minute sort of the, what is the shallow polemic about the filioque? Because if you don't go deeper and deeper, it's really easy to kind of get caught off guard by this uh, the shallow version of the polemic and be quickly convinced of, uh, you know, that the Greek Orthodox Church is the true church or something like that. Um, but I want to also emphasize before we get into this topic as well, is that uh, the, the title of this show is Against Three Errors of the Greeks. We're going to present four greek teachings about this topic there's four different doctrinal views among the greeks three of them are erroneous and i want to emphasize that when we talk about the greek schisms the roman position really only triumphs by a nose and we've talked about this eric um this is not a triumphant uh polemic um this is this is a dispute among separated brethren is what this is 
So even if we're if we're saying against the errors of you or you are our errors, your errors, this is this must be a, a dispute among separated brethren. Uh, if we can't do that, then we're not really Christians. So, Eric, any comments before we get further into the topic? I just want to say I agree wholeheartedly. I think that, um, you know, the, the, the golden rule applies here. Uh, do unto others as you would want done unto yourself, as our Lord Jesus Christ taught us. And uh, I think that applies definitely in this debate on the procession of the Holy Ghost. Um, it's such a, a difficult topic. It's one of the most difficult topics I have ever researched in my life. It, it, and, and I think because of that and, and because of the golden rule, we need to approach this very delicately and in charity. Yes, absolutely. I, it, this is really the breakdown. The definition of schism is, is, is a lack of charity. And so that's the, at the, really the heart of this. Um, so let me get into more of the topic. Now, I have researched a little bit. I'm going to get, we'll get into some of the history, but it, it does seem, so the three, if you're, if viewers are not familiar, the three Greek schisms are one, the Assyrian church of the East, i.e. the Syriac church, also called the Nestorian church, although they don't like that term. There's also number two is the Miaphysites or the Oriental Orthodox. That's like the Coptic church, the Assyrian, uh, the um, Armenian church, the Ethiopian church. And then there is the Eastern Orthodox, and that's the most numerous. That's the Russian Orthodox, obviously, the Greek Orthodox. Um, now, I have talked to one Syriac Orthodox scholar, uh, the Assyrian Church. He told me, and we'll get into the Syriac version of the Filioque, he told me that this is really not a doctrine that they have a problem with in terms of the, the spirit proceeding from the Father and the Son. Um, do you know anything about what the Oriental Orthodox say about this doctrine? So I, I, I've... I've not had any discussions with Oriental Orthodox scholars on the subject. I have had um, discussions with uh, people who are in seminary who are Oriental Orthodox who say they're, they're getting their views from their professors. Um, and they seem to have far less of an issue with this, if not um, no problem at all. So um, that's what I've seen. But I've also seen other Oriental Orthodox say that it is unacceptable, but not on any official scholarly level. Right. OK, so we'll get into a little bit more of that. Um, but in when we talk about sort of the we break down the Eastern Orthodox disputes with Roman Catholicism, there seems to be kind of the big two, at least historically. Uh, if we go like to 1054, even though we've we've discussed publicly, that's not that's not really the date of the Great Schism. That's just right. a, a date that's helpful for dating things. Sure. Um, but if we talk about like 1054, there's really the big two, which is the papacy and the filioque. Now, they at the time, they also added a bunch of other issues like Saturday fasting, celibacy, bearded or non bearded clergy, leavened and bread. But they don't sure. talk about those very much anymore. Right. Thankfully, that's that's those are no longer. So it's kind of boiling down to filioque and papacy. Now, I know there's other issues, but if we just set those aside for a minute, would you say that the filioque is which one is the stronger argument? It, it seems to me that the papacy is the more stronger. Filioque is weaker. What do you think? Uh, when you say meaning strengths in the competition between East and West on this issue. Yeah. So do they have a stronger case with the filioque against Rome, or do they have a stronger case with the papacy? Which of these is more? Um, uh, I would actually say that they have a stronger case against the papacy. Right. Um, okay. And and I think that on the filioque way, um, I think more vulnerabilities become clear from the orthodox per, per position. Yeah, that's that. That's exactly what. Yeah, that was what I was trying to say with my. Oh, adjectives. I'm sorry. I, I, no, yeah, yeah, I agree I, with you. Yeah, there's. <laughs> I I do think that especially with the papacy, it's kind of like the. It's like um, it's like evidence. Like with the with the filioque, they have to sort of, they have to find the phrase, uh, not father alone, if you will. They have to find the, you know, from the father alone. They have to find that in the patristics. Whereas with the papacy, there's kind of like. Uh, where is the where is the evidence for the papacy? You know, it's it's kind of like a, a lack of evidence uh, yeah. in a in a sense. Um, so the basically the um, one of the prominent books is by Edward uh, Shiansky, the Filioque: History of a Doctrinal 
controversy published by Oxford. And that's sort of a history of the filioque. And you wrote, you're, you titled your book the same. What makes your book different than that sort of standard text on, on this controversy? Yeah, so um, Dr. Zachensky, who um, when I'm with him, he's given me permission to call him Ed whenever we have exchanges. Um, Ed wrote this book just to give a survey of the doctrinal uh, the doctrinal controversy between the the East and the West. Um, I I felt he he did an, a fantastic job of keeping his personal views out of his book. But um, the the you know so he 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 scores a high score. I mean, I give this you know five out of five stars. But um, one of the handicaps when you don't want to give your own view is that um, the reader has to then do their own uh, weighing of the evidence, and it would have been nice to see you know, him come in at the end, or maybe, maybe he can write a smaller book on why he thinks one view is bright over the other. But I wanted to write a book where not only are, is the evidence being provided, but it's being shown how on the scales, one side is getting consistently favored from the evidence. And so I wanted to write a book where it actually provides that argument. Um, which side of the scales is getting mounted with weight? And I obviously think the Catholic side is. And, and I think this is, like you said, I think it's a stronger side for Catholicism than the papacy. So that's why I wrote this, this book, because I wanted to be a little bit more apologetic um, than simply just the investigator researcher yeah he's sort of the unbiased academic even though everybody's got a bias but it's kind of like here's both sides steel men on both sides which is certainly yeah. a good thing to have uh, as a you know just a text um so we're going to yeah. go into um i so i want to get so first part of this show i want to go through what are some of the history of this doctrine because one of the problems with east orthodox east west polemics i think is that we divorce the theology from the history. We we sort of abstract the the theology and we put it over here in a laboratory and we talk about it here. We don't realize that you know Photius was putting this out right when there's a massive political battle going on, and that's significant and that actually affects the way things come out historically. Theology doesn't just happen in a vacuum, um, but the but that's what produces the sort of shallow straw man attack on Rome regarding the filioque, which basically breaks down like this. There was this thing called the Nicene Creed, which we all agreed on. It was the Nicene Constantinopolitan Creed in 381. We all agreed on it. Everybody confessed it. But then Rome added to that creed unilaterally. They didn't ask anybody. And therefore, they departed from the Orthodox faith. They departed from the, Orthodox, the faith of the fathers by adding to the creed. Therefore, they went into heresy. Now, that's pretty much the shallow version uh i think that i don't know if you would agree with this eric but I, I would certainly be willing to concede that the addition of the filioque was at the at the very least a historical uh problem a a perhaps even a sin against charity we might say um it was a mistake it shouldn't have been added uh per, perhaps um perhaps if it wouldn't have been added it something could have been prevented. Uh, I think we could concede something here, um, but there's more historical historical complexities. What do you think about that? Yeah, it's tough to say because, you know, initially the way I looked at it when I studied the history, it did look very much like a sort of like a vindictive move. And, um, you know, students of the papacy, on they know that, um, the papacy is not meant to be a dictatorial office. I mean, even the Lord of Lord, the King of Kings himself said, I came not to be served, but to serve. And the greatest among you will be the least. So we should expect the papacy to have a, a, a far more uh, servant model leadership and an attempt to strengthen all the brethren as best as the successor of Peter can. 
but it almost looks like in this case it was just a, a roman intervention and it it just didn't even regard um what the eastern churches had to say about it so that's what it does look like especially initially um and so i can i, I certainly sympathize with people who say that this this really was a shot fired from the west um and and uh i, I do think that it, it probably should have been done differently on the other hand um the filioque doctrine had been so far into the bloodstream of the sanctity of western christendom latin christendom that uh it it, it was just inevitable that this thing would would at least become part of the, the the patrimony of the church in its public form. And, and so I also sympathize with those, uh, especially in Francia, uh, in, the, in Charlemagne's reign. Um, we often look at those people like they were somehow not as intellectual as the Greeks. I think they were intellectual giants, and I think they had very good reasons to support the filioque. Um, but, you know, the, there was a small little tussle between Rome and, and the Franks on this matter. And uh, eventually Rome kind of um, went the way that the Franks envisioned in the 8th century. So I, I do think that there's a, a good reason for the filioque, but I do think that the methodology by which the uh, filioque entered into the public recitation of the liturgy um, could have been done in a much more uh, conciliar manner uh, in light of the papacy's function and in light of the mission that Christ gave Peter, which is is not to be some sort of uh, um, isolated overlord, but it, it, he is meant to be um, sort of ecclesiastically wa washing the feet of all those who are below him. Um, it definitely has a slanted ca uh, character from what Christ uh, made the vocation of the papacy for. So I can see both sides, but yeah, I do agree with you that it 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 is it is a it was it could have been done differently. Yeah, I, I think what you said with Byzantine Scotus, he he made the point that if 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 we just assume that the filioque is not heresy at all, and it's just we're just talking about a serious canonical violation of changing the creed, is that really something that to to tear apart the mystical body of Christ over? Is that that's that's the real question? Yeah, so that's that's one of the points I bring out in uh, the first appendix of my book, um, which I basically just go ahead and concede that adding the filioque to the creed was a canonical crime. Let you know, I, I don't personally believe it was a canonical crime, but for the sake of the debate, let's I'll go out on the limb and just give that to the Greeks Orthodox side. Okay, fine. That was a canonical crime. Let's let's go forward with that. But if the filioque is a biblical doctrine, meaning it was biblical, patristic, and therefore divinely revealed from God himself, then the crime that the Greeks committed when they condemned the doctrine has far more weighty damage and it's more consequential on their side than it is on the Latin canonical criminality side. Yes. I hope that makes sense. Yes, and that's a, it's an extremely important point to raise. Um, and ultimately, there was the filioque in two creeds in the West long before 1054 happened. Uh, there was, the, as you said, the Frankish Latin Nicene Creed already had the filioque in it. And there was also the Quiquimque Volt, the Athanasian Creed right. also already had the filioque in it. So Rome and the East were keeping communion with a bunch of filioque creeds for, for centuries before this became this provocation. But the issue is that there was a bunch of political and social and cultural factors that were at play. The main uh, political and cultural narrative of the first millennium is that the Eastern Roman emperor and his patriarch are gaining more and more power over the first millennium. Uh, the papacy is also trying to react against that and asserting more power in, in, in response to that or out of his own initiative at times. Um, but then there's also these barbarians who are coming down and destroying Rome. And so 
the Pope of Rome is always trying to find help from armies in the East to fight against these barbarians. But the problem is that some of the armies in the East are actually heretics. They come over. Now they're iconoclasts. Now they're going to be heretic. There's or they're now they're, uh, uh, what next? You know, whatever Byz new Byzantine heresy is out is coming with their army to impose something on on the West. Right. And it's actually a number of Greek and Syrian popes, in fact, of Rome that start to look to the West and look to the North as political allies among the Franks. Um, and look, it's actually during an East-West schism, the Achaean schism is when uh, Clovis of... of the Frank Clovis the Frank is baptized during right. a, a schism in 490 or so. Um, so there's this political battle going on. Um, now that's the backdrop for the th theological doctrinal uh, history, uh, which I'd like to go through Daddy, right now. What's up, bud? I didn't disturb you, but I heard Peanut crying. Okay. He's coming from upstairs. All right, here I'll I'll, I'll, I'll take I'll yeah, I'll, I can yeah I I can. Well, here, uh, yeah, I'll give I'm gonna, a little history on that issue there. Here, here I'm and, gonna I'm gonna put up this outline here. You can no problem. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, like like Timothy was explaining, you know this the 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 dispute between East and West has various um, angles that we're approaching this from. It's very good to what to point out what he was saying is that the the popes of Rome are often look at looked at as sort of you know, one-sided overlords trying to do things all by themselves. But it's not all it's not always recognized that the Eastern churches and the Eastern patriarchs, particularly uh, the Patriarchate of Constantinople, was often overrun by imperial uh, dictatorship. And and this is how iconoclasm sort of spread in the East. And there was a there was a massive effort on the part of Emperor Leo, the Asarian, who's the, one of the first uh, iconoclastic emperors to force the West to succumb to iconoclasm. So when the West, when, when the Pope, the Latin Pope of Rome had no ability to appeal to help in the East, they, they, they were forced to seek for uh, physical protection of the spiritual assets of Christendom in the West. And this is, this is kind of how you, you get the papacy looking at Western powers as a way to defend, um, you know, the spiritual assets um, of the church in, in the West. But, you know, the filioque, like Timothy was saying, has two different creeds in the West, the, the quiconque volt. And if anybody uh, is not familiar with that, that's, that's also known as the Athanasian creed. And the Athanasian creed is... Uh, not written by St. Athanasius. Scholarship is pretty much unanimous on that point. But the fact of the matter is, it was considered in the West to be from the pen of St. Athanasius. And the West um, obviously venerated St. Athanasius the Great uh, with an immensity. So the Quicunque Volt, which explicitly teaches the Filioque, was thought to be binding doctrine for Latin Christendom. That's how important this issue was in the West. This is one of the reasons why by the time we get to the disputes between the Franks and the Greeks on this, the Franks were quite adamant on it. And it almost looks to some of the researchers of the 8th century that the Latins had this wild idea and that they had no place to be so forceful about it. But we're forgetting how deeply entrenched the filioque was in the consciousness and the theological consciousness of the West. And I'm talking here, Spain, Gaul, the Frank, Frankia, and uh, uh, especially North Africa, you see from Augustine and Fulgentius, there's a whole filioquist legacy that's led there. But, so that's that's talking about the Western origins of the, the filioque, obviously the Queen Conque Volt, um, and then also the Niceno Constantinopolitan Creed, which itself was had the filioque added to it for the first time at uh, a certain series of Spanish councils, the first of which was the Council of Toledo in 589. Here, um, the Arian king, the Visigothic king, Ricard I, 
he reigned from five uh he he reigned from uh or he was he reigned all the way to 601 AD and he was an Arian and he converted from Arianism to Catholicism and in Hispan His, Hispania in uh uh at the Council of Toledo there we see for the first time the filioque being added to the creed the Niceno Constantinopolitan creed so you've got two Latin creeds um, like Tim said the Athanasian Creed, Queen Conque Volt, and then you've got the Niceno Constantinopolitan Creed that also has the Filioque. And that that pretty much sets it in stone for Latin saints. And I, here I'm talking about Saint Isidore of Seville, um, his older brother, Saint Leander of Seville, and many other saints that we could count that that believed the Filioque and they believed that it was it was added to the creed. Um, in a in a licit manner. Now, did you already mention the Syriac version too? No, the no. Okay, four ten council of uh, I can never yeah, pronounce Seleucia it. Tessiphon. <laughs> there um, you go. You do it so, much better. Than so, that. The, so the thing to emphasize here is that oh, we have a very important commentator who's who has joined us. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sweetheart, you you don't want to you don't want to fall asleep while we talk about all these doctrinal controversies. I thought that would be boring enough. <laughs> no, it, it adds life to the, to the oh, yeah. podcast. Well, well, I'll get back. <laughs> no worries. <laughs> so, um, you know, so that you know, we have this. Uh, we have the two Latin creeds uh, with the filioque in it, and uh, by the time you get to the eighth century, um, this is one of the reasons why the Franks are so shocked that the Greeks don't have the filioque in the creed. So by the time you had certain monks, uh, you know, Frankish monks that uh, make it to Jerusalem to, uh, to to worship, they are found reciting Filioque in the Creed. And the Greeks there, they were like, wow, how, how, how do these people have this, this Filioque business in the Creed? And that's kind of where we get the beginning of the ball rolling, uh, where the, the Pope is brought into the picture to... Uh, he the, those those uh, those Latin monks in Jerusalem appealed to Leo Pope Leo the third, and Leo the third um, is the pope that's famous. Uh, the Greek Orthodox are often referring to Leo the third because he was um, he was the pope who actually had the original Nicene Constantinopolitan Creed engraved on two on uh, on a, on two plaques side by side, one in in Latin and one in 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 greek and they were equivalent and he had them put out publicly um in saint peter's um what what many people don't know though is that pope leo the third um who's venerated by the eastern orthodox by the way um he wrote extensively defending the theological um the, the theological correctness of the filioque so in other words he believed that it was definitely a divinely revealed doctrine that the Holy Ghost proceeds from the Father and the Son. However, he did think that for disciplinary reasons that it, it was not wise to revise what such great fathers came to agree upon at the councils of um, Constantinople, Constantinople I and uh, eventually with, with the Council of Chalcedon, which, which um, put an extra lock, so to speak, on the, on the Nicene Constantinopolitan Creed. So you've got, uh, you know, we, we've got to get, you know, back to where this becomes a contra controversy with Photius the Great. Photius is really where the Greeks begin to have um, a big theological problem with the Filioque. You have precedents before. So, for example, you've got the writings of Theodore of Mopsuestia and Theodore of Cyrus, and those two Greek theologians in the in the uh, latter part of the um, in the latter part of the uh, fourth century, going into the fifth century, especially with Theodoret, um, they they speculate on the theology of Saint Cyril of Alexandria, believing that the that the Spirit somehow comes from the Son. So you have you already have a sort of precursor to Greek concerns about this issue of the sun, uh, the spirit coming from the sun 
in some way. Uh, Cyril of Alexandria, I believe, taught the substance of the filioque way. But it, we don't see a Greek and Latin debate um, until another precursor, which is during the 7th century with an encyclical letter of Pope Theodore um, of Rome, who was actually a Greek himself. And I think it was it was it was either Martin or Theodore, Pope Martin or Pope Theodore. I can't remember, um, but um, one of the two uh, wrote an encyclical letter to the uh, to the East, uh, and in that in that uh, in, in that um, in that document, it, he makes a reference to the to the procession of the Holy Spirit from the Father and the Son, and that raised up concerns in the East. And this is one of the reasons why Saint Maximus, the Confessor, comes in with his famous uh, intervention. We say um, with his letter to Marinus, explaining that the Latins are not teaching a heretical doctrine with the filioque way, that they're teaching perfectly orthodox teaching, if you understand it correctly to east to greek eastern ears so that that put the qualm down but photius is really where we see uh, a resurrection of a mighty anti anti filioquist agenda and uh, photius is famous for his uh, long document called the mystagogy of the holy ghost and in that document he gives out his philosophical theological reasons for why the filioque does damage to a coherent trinitarian theology and you know his objections were that if you have the holy spirit proceeding from the father and the son that that confuses the father and the son in their hypostatic properties so the Father is the cause of all deity. The, both Latins and Greeks believed that. St. Augustine believed that. Um, the Catholic Church today believes that. Um, but Photius saw that if you're going to make the Father and the Son uh, the eternal cause of the Holy Spirit, then now you've confused the hypostatic properties. And so Father and Son become what's called like a homo hypostasis, or one person between the two. And if you make one person between the two, then you've destroyed the, the duality or, or the distinction between the Father and the Son. Um, the other argument that Photius had was that if you have the Holy Spirit proceeding from the Father and the Son, that the Holy Spirit now does not participate in something essential or natural to the Godhead, and because of that, the, the Holy Spirit became subordinated. This is one of the popular arguments you see online um, by Orthodox bloggers. They're just sort of re rehearsing Photius's arguments and his mystagogy. Well, going forward from uh, Photius of Constantinople, um, you've got Latin responses. And the Latin defenses of the filioque way, um, they were not all as strong as they could have been. Uh, you had certain defenses of the filioque way that were certainly stronger than others. But certainly by the time you get to the uh, 13th century at the Council of Lyons, 1274, uh, the Latin West has had, had time to really build a theological defense for the filioque way. And this comes uh, majorly from uh, scholastic theologians. I mean, the, the most famous one is St. Thomas Aquinas, who actually was on his way to the Council of Lyons, but he actually died uh, in his journey to go to the Council. And he's famous for his document, you know, the, the Errors of the Greeks. And, and the, you know, in that document, he spent a lot of time meditating on this issue and for Aquinas, he thought that the Greeks really fundamentally misunderstood the Latin doctrine of the filioque way. In any case, by 1274, um, the, the, uh, the Greeks in Constantinople had time to really figure out, um, okay, what are the Latins really saying? You know, because Photius didn't really have the opportunity to really study any theological defenses of the filioque way. But by the time you get into the 13th century medieval Byzantium period, um, they had had time to look at what the Latins were saying and in some translations. 
and they still had an issue with it, but they recognized that the Latins were pointing to uh, many statements in the Fathers that speak about the Holy Spirit proceeding from the Father through the Son. So in the Greek, um, that would mean to who you, um, yeah, to through who you, through the Son. And uh, in the Latin, that would be per filium, um, proceed from the Father through the Son. And uh, the Latins were extracting from this that it, it's basically a, you know, we call it sometimes a dual procession. We don't mean that there's actually two, you know, two different spirations, um, but that the, the Holy Spirit does proceed from both Father and the Son as from one principle. Some Greeks in Constantinople, given the chance to really examine this doctrine, actually came to agree that the Latins had a case here. One of those men um, was uh, one of the patriarchs of Constantinople, John the Tenth Bekos, um, who who he was actually condemned by the Greek hierarchy, and he was condemned by the Greek hierarchy because. Uh, once those texts from the Latins were observed, he was able to go through a, an, and produce a florilegium of the Eastern Fathers where the tu, th uh, tu thu huyu was, was matching the Latin perfilium. And because those two things matched for him, he thought, no, this is actually a, we actually have an opportunity to unite the, the, the two halves of Christendom again. Well, the Byzantines would not have that because they did not believe that the perfilium of the Latins was the same thing as the uh, uh, um, tuthu huyu of the of the Greek patristics, and so you had um, you had theologians like Nicholas Blamides and Gregory uh, the second of Cyprus. Gregory actually replaced uh, eventually um, Bekos as the patriarch of uh, of Constantinople. I think it was his immediate successor or one successor after the previous. Um, and Gregory of Cyprus, who uh, I'll just refer to him as the Cypriot, because that's just a little easier for me to continue, continually say Gregory of Cyprus. Uh, the Cypriot, yeah, he wrote a certain tom or a tomas in Greek. And that tomas was actually um, an official response to the arguments of John Bekos in favor of union with the Latins, based upon this whole intersectional unity between the uh, Tuthe Huyu of the Greek patristics and the Perfilium of the Latins. But it ended up also being a condemnation of the Latin Council of, of Lyons, 1274, um, sort of like a, a final canonization that, no, we are not uniting with the Latins, and John Bekos is wrong, and, and they eventually put that into ratification or legislated law at the Council of Blackernay in 1285. And that's where you get this um, introduction of the uh, orthodox understanding of an eternal relationship between the Son and the Holy Spirit. Timothy, you're back. I don't know if you want to tag in here and um, say anything. Uh, sure, yeah. I, I, I just had... Just had my daughter. She was just happy, and then right when you started talking, she started being unhappy. Oh man, I'm sorry. <laughs> man, it was my fault. We had we had <laughs> nap time planned perfectly, but then nap time didn't materialize like I thought. Oh, that's one okay. minute. That's okay. I I had uh, had a chance to talk about the uh, two Latin creeds, and we kind of fast forward through the uh, disputes in the eighth century, and then um, briefly touched on Photius, his arguments in the Mystagogy. And then now we're at the 13th century where you've got this medieval um, bridge that, that had opportunity to be made between the, the Council of Lyons, where you've had a, a much more fully developed defense of the Latin filioque. And then also you had the Greeks, the Greek theologians in the East who had the opportunity, unlike Photius, to actually look at what the Latins were saying. Well, Bekos was condemned by the Greeks at the council. Uh, actually, he was condemned prior to, but he had a chance to, you know, get a hearing again um, at the Council of Blackernay, 1285. And people need to understand this is a huge marker in, in Byzantine history. The Council of Blackernay, uh, 1285, 
is where we first see the Greeks articulate some sort of acceptance that the Son of God has some sort of mediatorial relationship to the Holy Spirit in the ad intra relationship of the Trinity. And uh, there's a couple of different interpretations of the Council of Black Rene. Um, you've got the Neo Palamite interpretation, which I think Tim has a, um, he right. has the different views here. So there's um, four Greek views on the Philoque. You've you've touched on Photius, I think. Um, yes. There's so there's four. Um, so uh, let, let me let take the opportunity while my cr daughter's not crying to provide yeah. my comment here. I, so I don't know what you actually said about the history, but the, so, I mean, the bottom line for me is that. There's no patristic terminological consensus about the eternal production of the relationship of the Son to the Spirit. There is the Antiochian terminology, there's the Alexandrian terminology, there's the Syriac terminology, there's the Latin terminology. It's simply not a question that was ratified and with a consensus among the fathers. It simply does not exist. There is, however, a patristic consensus on the fact that the all the persons of the Trinity, the, the all three persons of the Trinity, have their origin in some sense with the Father. The Father is the origin of the Godhead, if you will. There's this monarchy of the Father. Um, and so when the Greek Constantinopolitan Creed is sent to all the bishops of the entire world, after the Syriac Christians get under the, after their, they, they were enduring a persecution during the whole fourth century uh, under the uh, Emperor Shapur II in Persia. So they didn't have any time to deal with this. They got out of the persecution, but then they got the Greek creed and they said, well, then they, they translated it into Syriac and they didn't have any problem with altering Greek canons and making their own canons. And the same with the Latin West. They got the Greek creed. They did certain. It, hold on. Just a minute, Bob. So they they had these different interpolations. There's not only the Filioque, there's two other interpolations. They changed the grammar in the Latin to fit the Apostles Creed because that was really the main creed at the time. And they also added God from God. That's not in the Greek version either. So they have. So we have we have Christians in in the east of the Roman Empire in the Syriac East in the Persian Empire, and we have also Christians on the western side. They're all adding to the creed at will. They not none of them feel the need to have this as a ratified creed until the Emperor of 451 begin, begins to make it sort of this imperial citizenship. And that's sort of after the fact. So this is becoming in, imposed in the liturgy after these other reaches of Christianity have already been adding to the creed and conforming it to their local customs and their local patristic uh, consensus. Um, and so it's only later on when this starts to become a problem. Um, and we have, you want to say hello? Say hi. 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 What do you need, bud? <laughs> The ketchup has that white thing on it. Oh, here, why don't you go get the ketchup and bring it back here. I'll open it for you, okay? <laughs> All right. Um, so the so the bottom line is that the idea that so the first premise when we go back to our shallow straw man in the very beginning of this show, it starts with the premise that there's this whole patristic consensus about the Nicene Creed of 381, which that didn't I mean, there is in theory, like yes, everyone agrees to it, but we already see in the very beginning. Um, we have these local bishops who are freely translating it into their own language and they're freely adding to it or adjusting it according to their local customs and their local liturgies. So that's already happening, happening for centuries. And then, as you pointed out, St. Leander, an Orthodox saint, is the one who ratifies the Latin creed. I'm, I'm not sure if we know from the manuscripts if it was actually inserted or if he, you know, if what if St. Leander just said, oh, well, here's my manuscript. It already has a feeling. Like, who knows where he got it? You know, they just copied it down through the centuries. Mm -hmm. Who knows who added it exactly? But they, as you said, it's already in the bloodstream of the Latin West. They are already understanding this. And the Syriac yeah. church is already there. Yes, there's an eternal relationship. So I think it's it's hard to start to make this argument, as you said, it's, it's this vulnerability of the, the Greek Orthodox position here, is that they seem to be taking either one father or some section of the fathers and then imposing that on all the other fathers as if that's what a patristic consensus is. Well, I, I don't think that that's the way we should work as, as Catholics, as Orthodox Christians. We should take all the fathers as one, take look at what all the fathers said together, and then try to bring... A consensus out of that 
Absolutely. I mean, that's that was the Florentine project. Right. So, uh, yeah, let, so Florence. yeah, let me pull up uh, because one of the things that Orthodox will say is that they'll say, well, the Orthodox Church rejects the filioque. And then they'll say, well, then you can ask, well, what? OK, well, what is the Orthodox doctrine on the filioque then? If the Orthodox rejects the filioque, sometimes if you become Orthodox, you're, you are actually liturgically re you re liturgically renounce the filioque. Well, then what is the what is the Orthodox doctrine of the eternal relationship between the spirit and the son? Well, as you started to, to note here, there are four different views among right. the Greeks. Um, so I don't know which of these you've already gone through, but do you want to break down some of these one, two, three? Yeah. Yeah, I know. We, we, I talked about Photius, you know, and, and Photius's arguments against the filioque, but his positive, you know, his position on on this matter was was basically the monopatrist position um monopatrism which literally means you know from the you know from god the father alone and uh photius was a strict adherent to um when it comes to the procession of the holy ghost that it is from the father alone and that was that's basically what he's arguing for in his mystagogy now the I would argue that Photius's position, his main position, is is basically maintained for the other Greek Orthodox positions. However, um, there are there is some development, some added color to the uh, subsequent medieval Byzantine theology on the on the procession of the Holy Ghost. So the next thing, like I had mentioned, was the Council of Blackernay with that whole standoff between John Bekos and the Cypriot um, of Constantinople. And at that council, um, the, the Cypriot, um, he basically said, no, John Bekos is wrong that this timeless inter this this timeless um, reality of the spirit through the sun has nothing to do with the spirit's hypostatic origin. It rather has to do with what's called this eternal illumination or eternal manifestation through the sun. And so he envisions that the, the Holy Spirit is completely a finished product when it comes to causation from the Father alone. So the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father. Boom, that's it. Photius' monopatrism is maintained. But then he adds this other element. He says, yes, the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father alone, and, and, and he's a that procession is a finished product from the Father alone, but that the Holy Spirit is manifested through the Son eternally. So kind of like um, the analogy he gave was the, the light that emits from the rays of the sun. So you have the sun, and then you've got the rays of the sun, and then you've got the light that emits from the rays of the sun. And the idea was the Holy Spirit is like the, 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 the light that emits from the rays, where its, its cause is the sun, not the rays. And so because of that, um, the Cypriot at the Council of Blackerne condemned this idea that there could be any involvement of the sun as cause of the Holy Spirit. So that's the eternal manifestation. Now there's different interpretation of that, which is number three here on the list, which is the Neopalamite interpretation of the Cypriot. The Neopalamite interpretation actually takes a different view um, than, than Gregory of Cyprus, I believe. They think they're interpreting Gregory of Cyprus correctly. They would say that, no, what the Gregory of Cyprus is talking about with the, the sun, the rays, and the light that emits from the rays is actually what's called the energetic procession. Now, um, some of the listeners here who might be familiar with the famous debate between the, the Palamites and the Thomists on the issue of the essence and energies distinction, don't let that muddle the, the discussion here. Um, basically, what we're talking about here is not too controversial. Uh, in God, you have essence and activity. I mean, even the Latins talk about that, but we call it activity or operation. The Greeks 
the Greeks today, um, the you know, the Orthodox today like to use inner gay. They like to use the literal English, you know, attempt to be closer to the to the way that the Greek sounds um, energies. But, you know, even even Orthodox the, theologians recognize that in English, we sh it's kind of hard to say energies because it doesn't convey the idea too much. Um, it's better to talk about operations or activity. So when when God does an action, let's say, and, and here I'm speaking, you know, uh, I'm speaking just analogously. When God does an action, for example, like create the world, he does that in a certain unity between Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, but it, it also happens in a certain triadic order. It's from the Father, through the Son, and in the Holy Spirit. So it's a cooperative action, but there is a certain ordering to it. And, you know, St. Paul brings up this ordering in 1 Corinthians 9 when he talks about how all things are from God the Father, all things are through the Son of God. That, okay, that from and through, ek, dia, are not talking about two different things that are added together as a summation of two different things. It's basically the same natural action between the Father and the Son, and there's no division between it. So the Greeks here, the Neopalami position, is basically saying, you know, we can talk about an eternal procession of the Holy Spirit from the Son, um, because in the activity of God, it's triadic, and it is in the order of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But the problem with this is that there's almost no patristic evidence for it. There's no, there's no patristic evidence that the procession of the Holy Spirit is talking about the energetic procession. I've never been able to see any evidence of that. And I do think, like, like Timothy wrote here in the document, I think it is an imposition upon, uh, upon the Cappadocian understanding of the Trinity. I think they're, they're putting in a false category into the Cappadocians. Now, let me just make a disclaimer here. I don't, I'm not arguing that the Cappadocians don't say anything about the distinction between uh, God's essence and, and his activities. I'm just saying that that div that distinction doesn't really play a role in when when the Cappadocians talk about the procession of the Holy Spirit through the Son. Um, some notable names um, that people will will obviously you know they'll obviously recognize if they're in any sort of know with Catholic and Orthodox relations is Father the late Father Vladimir Losky. Um, he, he wrote a famous book, The Mystical Theology of the Eastern Church. You've got Father John Meyendorf, who is a, a, another um, you know, Greek Orthodox theologian who, who is a, considered a Neopalamite. And living today, um, we could point to uh, Dr. Marcus Plested, um, and he, he's a professor of theology over at Marquette um, in, in, in Wisconsin. And, and these scholars would say, yes, there is a filioque in a sense, but it's in the category of God's activity, not in the category of the hypostatic origin of the Holy Spirit. So they, they imposed that also on the Council of Blackernay 1285. In my reading and in the reading of some other uh, Orthodox theologians, and that brings us to um, the uh, the fourth view here, which is uh, basically the 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 pioneer in the Greek world, is John Bekos, um, and there are some Orthodox scholars today who take this view. For example, uh, Peter Gilbert, I think uh, he would definitely uh, he's sort of given his whole life to studying um, Bekos and his corpus on this pneumat pneumatological reality of the procession of the Holy Ghost, and Kalistos Ware. Um, who I think often gets belittled today um, by Orthodox researchers. Um, and that's probably because so many people in the English world think that by appealing to Kalistos Ware, that that somehow settles the debate for everything, because he's kind of like the Pope of the English-speaking world uh, in the Orthodox world. That's not actually true. He's not, you know, he doesn't have any, you know, binding authority. However, he is an intellectual giant, and he's been involved in so much of the scholarship 
in in uh, both the Greek world and the English world on on Palamas, Gregory Palamas, and uh, relations with the uh, Latins. If you pick up his book, The Orthodox Church, go to the index and find everything you can on the filioque way. And I, I agree with about 85% of everything he said, especially with how the Greek Orthodox view um, can be reconciled with the uh, Latin filioque way, um, given a certain explanation. Uh, were you just mentioning Callistos were there? I was yes. gone for a minute. Okay, yeah, right. Yeah. That's what I thought. Um, yeah, I think that it's it's basically um, the the thing about Beckos to me is that as we we discussed before is that Lacerne condemns the Leon doctrine. It condemns Beckos, and it says that there's an eternal manifestation through the Son, but Orthodox cannot answer. They cannot philosophically explain why that doctrine or how that doctrine is truly different than eternally proceeds from the father and the son, except by saying it is, there's no philosophical justification. Uh, you can say eternal manifestation through the son. Well, how is that difference than proceeding from the father and the son? Exactly. Well, it's an eternal manifestation. Well, how yeah. is that different? Because it's a, it, it, there's no, uh, there's no explanation as to, it's just it's basically nominalism. It's introducing nominalism into into uh, the Orthodox world, which is bad. It's bad philosophy. You can't just say something's different and not explain how it's different. And that's what I, do, I get when I when I talk to Orthodox about this. How do you how do you confess an eternal relationship of production through the son? But it's not a procession from the father and the son. Yeah, which is why the energies doctrine is so appealing. Um, because it actually gets us into a different category. Um, and, and Gregory Palamas, uh, in my reading, which I, I don't know, I can't read him freely in Greek, um, but for all the English translation I've acquired through the scholarship that's on both sides of this debate, um, meaning both sides within the G Greek Orthodox world, um, they seem to believe that he that Palamas was only willing to believe in an energetic procession of the Holy Spirit, um, which is another reason why he was open to speaking about how the Holy Spirit can be the love of the Father and the Son. By me, by that he doesn't mean to really match up with what Saint Augustine was saying in his psychological analogy uh, with um, intellection and volition. Here, uh, Gregory Palamas is talking about simply the natural love of God, the Trinity, the whole Trinity, the Holy Spirit can be looked at um, from that angle um, in, 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 some, in, in some sense where each the Father, the Son also have a participation in that love. Um, it, you know, there, there have been some Orthodox theologians that have tried to say, well, maybe this can bridge with Augustine. I don't think it can, because as soon as you go into the category of energy or action in God, now we're not talking about hypostatic particularities anymore. Now we're talking about basically what's equal in the Trinity. When, when, when God creates the world, when he sanctifies the soul, when he sent the Holy Spirit uh, on the day of Pentecost, you know, we're we're talking temporality in the in God here. We're obviously speaking analogically, but that's that's natural activity. It's it's the same in the Father. It's the same in the Son, and it's the same in the Holy Spirit. Whereas the Greek fathers that the, the that the that the count that the Latin bishops at the Council of Florence were bringing to the table, they were talking about a, a hypostatic particularity of the Holy Spirit from the Son, not this natural cooperative activity or energy from the trinity in general right um this is so what what we're seeing here is that there's the greeks divide against each other as to how exactly it's not the latin doctrine but they agree that it's not the latin doctrine and this is to me this right here this this phenomenon that we're trying to describe here that's not the way that the church works when the church has a doctrinal problem, doctrinal controversy, they assemble in a holy and ecumenical council and they resolve it. And they did so at Lyon. And that was what Beckos agreed to initially. 
And I, well, he did, did agree with that. He never recanted it to my knowledge. Um, but that's what many Greeks did agree with. But what we see really is that there are these factions among the Greeks. Some Greeks are unionists. They're okay. They can play ball with the Latins. They can get along with the Latins and work it out. Other Greeks, no, not so much. I wanted to read this text from Florence, um, which is, um, let me see. Yeah, here it is. Okay, so this is the this is right before this is from the decrees of the council, and this is describing the back and forth that the dialogue that the Greeks and Latins had at Florence. It says this quote: "All were aiming at the same meaning in different words. The Greeks asserted that when they claim that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father, they do not intend to exclude the Son, but because it seemed to them that the Latins assert that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son as from two principles and two spirations, they refrain from saying that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son." The Latins asserted that they say the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son, not with the intention of excluding the Father from being the source and principle of all deity, that is, of the Son and the Holy Spirit, nor to imply that the Son does not receive from the Father, but because the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Son, nor that they posit two principles or two aspirations. Uh, since then, one and the same meaning resulted from all this. They unanimously agreed and consented to the following holy and God-pleasing union. And this is where Florence breaks down and essentially says, the Greek fathers say one thing, the Latin fathers say another thing, but they're both meaning to, they're both tending towards the same thing, which is that the father is the sole origin of the Godhead and that the spirit proceeds from the father through the son or father or from the father and the son as from one principle, but the relationship of the spirit to the son is one sort of an indirect relationship in terms of origin because the father is the only origin. And so they're both tending towards the same thing. They're just answering different aspects with different terminology. And this is ultimately what I think what uh, a study of the fathers, uh, an objective study of the fathers comes to is that we come to these different terminologies that are really trying to answer the same question. Yes, absolutely. And, and, and this is really the only way to make a coherent picture because, um, the Greeks at Florence, um, they they knew that you could not have the Latin fathers teaching one thing and the Greek fathers teaching something totally different, such that there's a heresy that arises in between the mutually venerated fathers of the church, either in the West or the East. So that's one of the things today sometimes you see some of the Orthodox might say, well, the, Lat the Latins may have taught that, but the Greeks taught this. Well, see, that kind of thinking and mentality was intolerable to people like um, Basarian of Nicaea or St. John of Damascus. St. John of Damascus, he said that the fathers are basically infallible, nearly, and that if there ever is some sort of variance in the fathers, that we should do everything we can to make a, a, a reconciliation possible. Okay, this was when he was considering the objection that maybe Apophanius had destroyed one of the holy images. He says, okay, he doesn't he didn't believe the authenticity of that report, but he said, even if you have a variance of that tiny crumb in the fathers that's still the tiny crumb compared to the majority, right? So the Damascene's vision on the unity of the fathers, that gained a, lot, a huge anchor in Greek patristic consciousness, which is one of the reasons why the Greeks at Florence were convinced about the filioque, because the Latins were producing so many documents that show that there is a clear teaching on the filioque in the Latin, and that it can comport with certain statements in the Greek East and the Eastern Fathers. And so the only way to have a coherent picture here is to come to that precise summary that you just gave, that yes, they speak differently. They, they do a certain model difference on the Trinity. Perhaps Augustine squeezed a little bit tighter around the notion of da, da, divine simplicity. 
I, I, I happen to not think so. I think Gregory of Nyssa just had his hand just as tight around that doctrine. Um, but um, there's a different way to describe the same target that we're aiming to, to hit. And I think the Florence Project achieved that. However, the, the, the Greeks understood that, but they did not see the theological coherence of making the father a primordial cause and the son a derivative cause if those two things become one in the production of the Holy Ghost. So their issue was a theological coherence problem. They did not believe that you could do that without doing violence to the logic of the Trinity. And so this is one of the reasons why um, the, the Orthodox have always been against the theology of the filioque. The addition to the creed is actually subordinate of a problem to the theological divergence. Yeah, I was wondering if you could bring up the text that you have in your book, which is from the scripture in particular that you thought that was one of the best texts to support the theological coherence of the of the of the filioque. I believe it was um no, not John 15. What was the one where it's John 16? The... Yeah. 16. Yeah. Can yeah. you can you break that down for us? Yes. Let me just uh open Is it up. oh I still have many things to say to you, right? But you cannot yes. bear them. John now. 16, I think it's 13 and forward. Yeah, but... so 16, 12 to 15 says, However, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will tell you things to come. He will glorify me, for he will take of what is mine and declare it to you. All things that the Father has are mine. Therefore, I said that he will take of mine and declare it to you. Yes. And so what you have there um, is this statement by Christ that the Spirit is going to learn information. <laughs> Which, um, again... It's like one of those, you know, uh, it, it's kind of quasi that quasi Arian sense where, oh, the son said that he's less than the father. So here the spirit has to be a creature because Christ says that the spirit is going to learn from the son what to say. So this is one of the reasons why some of the early, early theologians in the Christian community thought that the spirit was a creature of the father and the son. Um, but obviously the church rejected that, but, but how do you reject that? Because it literally says that the spirit is going to hear from the son and then do what the son tells him basically to say. And so how do you have an eternal person in the Trinity learning new information? Well, this kind of goes back to the way the son of God also said, when he said, I don't speak of my own, I speak of that which I hear from the Father. Well, some theologians say, well, we can say that about the Son because he's got a human nature. So we can just temporalize that, that the, the, the human nature of the Son is what receives new information. But the problem is you don't have any temporal nature to the Holy Spirit. <laughs> so now how do you uh, reconcile the eternality of the spirit yet with this talk about receptivity from the son and so what the early theologians like saint cyril of alexandria did i have the precise statement in in his commentary on the gospel of john which happens to be the text that saint maximus pointed to where the latins derived their filioque well saint cyril of the saint cyril of alexandria said well, the Spirit receives from the Son in a God-befitting way. In other words, he eternally receives from the Son, just like the Son eternally receives from the Father. <laughs> it's such a beautiful scriptural testimony to the filioque. Just like the Son went by being begotten, he receives the divine essence from the Father. He receives divine knowledge equality of divine power, equality of divine, um, uh, the truth, activity, will, equality of will, volition. 
the son receives that from the father. It's not like he has an, a, 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 a subtracted dose from the father. No, he gets all of the essential uh, deity from the father. And the same way the Holy Spirit receives from the son, meaning he hears from the son, meaning he receives information from the son, which is another part of the divine essence, right? What's in What God has is equal to God. Okay, so the spirit receives information, be, may, may, talking about knowledge and power and will from the son. So you've got this order from the father to the son in the Holy Spirit in their hypostatic origination, because the son gets all of that equality from the father in his generation. So the Holy Spirit gets it all from the son or from the father through the son in his procession. So we're talking about hypostatic origination. If you bear with me for just a few seconds, I could read a comment by St. Cyril that speaks to this issue. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. This comes from his uh, his commentary on the Gospel of John. If you have my book, it's uh, the listeners can turn to page 126. He writes, quote, The reason he says he will receive what is mine is that the Spirit is of the same substance with the Son and proceeds through him in a God-befitting way, thus possessing all perfect activity and power over all things. We believe that the Spirit subsists of himself, and that he truly is what he is, and is said to be, even as he exists in the essence of God, and proceeds in issues from it, possessing in himself all that belongs to it by nature. Then the statement that the Spirit receives something from the only begotten is completely unimpeachable and free from blame, since he proceeds through him by nature as his own Spirit. Close quote. This is one of the reasons why Theodore of Mopsuestia and Theodoret of Cyprus were, or Cyrus were, uh, 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 they were pulling their hair out of their their head because um cyril is basically saying that the spirit derives from the son eternally i'm not one of those who believes that cyril rejected the filioque in his responses to theodoret that's a whole nother debate um but yeah you asked me the best text in the new testament for the filioque it's definitely john 16 there's obviously there's obviously some surrounding uh, context that somebody needs both biblically and theologically but that's really a locus classicus for uh, uh, the Latin filioque in the Bible right so the um, so th what you're getting at hoop hypostatic origination uh, the the Greek Cappadocian uh, Photian critique is that every person of the Holy Trinity must be related in a unique way to the Father and if the spirit proceeds from the father and the son then he has the same relationship with the son as he does with the father therefore the father and the son are the same person yeah homo but, hypostasis yep. but the answer the latin answer is that he proceeds as saint augustine said principally from the father the father is still the principal and he proceeds through the son or from the son because the son receives everything from the father. Yeah. He proceeds thirdly, if you will. Um, and that's why we say, we also say procession. He's not begotten. Right. He's, he's proceeding. Right. And what is the Greek uh, rejoinder to that? So Just like, no, that doesn't work. Yeah. You know, so th they would basically, you know, so like you just said, you know, the, the Latins talk about this singularity of principle. There's one principle of the Holy Spirit, that spiritive procession, that spiritive act um, that's that's equal in the Father and the Son. So it's not like the Father's doing something, and then the Son comes and adds his something, and then the, the cumulative summation between the two is what produces the Holy Spirit. That's what freaked out the Greeks. So... The Latins maintain the singularity of principle um, of the Holy Spirit, but within that one principle, there's a duality that emerges when we consider 
how they have that spiritive principle. In other words, the scholastics would call it active spiration. How does the son have this singular active spiration? And how does the father have the active singular spiration? Because it's one spiration. It can't be two hands coming to join, you know, two different things coming to become one thing. It's got to be one thing. Well, now we make a duality where the father has that in himself, meaning he doesn't derive that spiritive principle from anyone. He has it, he's he has the abundance of fertility in producing another person in himself. The son does not have the, the abundant fertility to produce another person in himself. He right. has to receive that from the father. And that's what maintains the hypostatic uniqueness of each divine person. Of both, of both the father and the son. So when you consider their persons, you see a distinction. But when you consider the spiritive action, they are not distinct. So that's the fundamental philosophical difference that the Greek Orthodox to this day largely reject. So I, I want to close this out by the, the sort of final points here and then take any questions. Any, if anybody has questions, we can get those in just a minute for Eric. Um, once again, please buy his book. It's linked below. The Filioque um, goes a lot deeper than we can get through even in an hour and a half here. Uh -huh. um, so the, the bottom line is that the Council of Florence is really the only position which with Beckos, with certain Greeks, certain modern Greeks as well, like Greek Orthodox, Peter Gilbert, Eastern Orthodox, Metropolitan, Cleese says, where some Orthodox do agree with this, um, that all the fathers do not have a total consensus. What's up, bud? So can you give me some water? Because sure, I'm sure, bud, here. Um, here's some water, buddy. Yeah, here, take that. Take this glass right here, okay? All right. Um, so the Council of Florence does justice to the patristic consensus because it, it allows the fathers to be unique in their particulars, uh, but result, uh, result, um, brings them together, basically, synthesizes them into one doctrine of the Trinity, and then dogmatizes it. Whereas the Eastern Orthodox who reject this, they then disagree as to what exactly is the, the doctrine. Now, to be fair, there are certain divergences within the Florentine boundaries, namely among the Thomas and the Scotus. They have different, uh, more particulars in terms of how this is explained, but that's not what the Florentine dog dogma is. The Florentine dogma is that the spirit proceeds from the father and the son as from one principle. The spirit or the father is the principle of the Trinity. That's the dogma. As far as more particulars between Thomas and Scotus, that's not dogma. So no Catholic is required to become a Thomist or a Scotist on particular questions within these boundaries. Um, and that's one of the things that I've, I've had one Eastern Orthodox I've talked to. He thought that you had to understand it in a Thomistic sense you're you're required to do it that way and and but that's not the way that catholic dogma is working at florence it's 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 making a general dogma which synthesizes the various patristic witnesses and then it doesn't go any further it just says this is what we know is dogma further particulars are not dogmatized um but nevertheless as i said uh orthodox converts are sometimes forced to reject the filioque but they're not actually forced to um confess any particular orthodox doctrine um so this is what i mean when i say that there is no orthodox church vis-a-vis -vis western heresies there's basically a general rejection of various western heresies but there's not an alternative that's authoritatively binding among all orthodox christians uh in response to this um orthodox apologists might tell you that there is but they can't really prove that like Karen is ecumenical and binding to everyone or that this view is binding to everyone. They can just assert it basically. Um, and you're going to, as we said, you're going to have some bishops or priests who agree or some who do not, who don't. Uh, but yeah. And I, I think that um, Maximus, the confessor 
um, is really used by a lot of contemporary Orthodox uh, anti filioquists um, to try and say, oh, well, if we if the Latins can just agree with Maximus, then this whole debate would go away. So you, you saw this. This was Mark of Ephesus's position at the Council of Florence. Um, and what a lot of Orthodox today will say, oh, well, the Latins rejected um, the letter to Marinus by Maximus because, because Maximus there said that the Holy Spirit is not a cause. I'm sorry. The Son is not a cause of the Holy Spirit. But it, it, even Dr. Ed Sachensky, in his uh, in his you know his sort of his magnum opus on the filioque for Oxford University Press, on page one sixty five, he puts that view to rest. You know because in in the memoirs of Syropoulos, who was a, a, a Orthodox polemicist, um, that was recounting the history of the Florence Council. Um, he made it seem like, well, the Latins just rejected Maximus because it said that he that the Holy Spirit is not caused by the Son. But if you go to Sachinsky, which is a far better book, far more balanced, um, on the history of Florence, page 165, he even he quotes what the Latins said um, at the council, which was they agreed with e even the Greek Archbishop Bissarion of Nicaea that no, we can agree with Maximus that the Son is not the primordial cause of the Holy Spirit, which means the the absolute font and fo the fontal source of all of all generation of deity. That is exclusively the Father's, and the Son has no part in that. Okay, but that when when the the Father's fertility inspirating the spirit through active spiration, the son derivatively joins in that active spiration. And so that's why we could speak of the, a procession from the father through the son. So there was a way to reconcile the, the, the Maximian letter, but it, what doesn't get reported is that the Latins, the Latins had a concern over the authenticity of that letter, as did some of the Greeks. They, the Basarian himself, at the council said that we don't know if this is uh, authentic because they didn't have the entirety with them. They had a fragment. So we need to have more historical context when we're just simply saying, oh, the Latins denied Maximus and that that's the criteria for union. That was the position of Mark of Ephesus. And that's the position today. The Latins don't accept the letter to Marinus. Well, it's much more complex uh, as I've just described. Yes, um, it, it, it's, it, it, this is, I would um, look at Peter Gilbert, again, he's an Eastern Orthodox patristic scholar, and he notes that uh, the letter to Marinus is, one, it's coming from, St. Maximus is a Greek who lived in the West for a time, and he knew Latin perfectly well, unlike Photius, perhaps, or other Greeks later on, and he knew the Latin patristics, and he could say that what they mean by these terms is that the father is the sole cause. And as you just said, the Latins at Florence were willing to accept it that way. Unless you interpreted Maximus as excluding any type of eternal production from the sun whatsoever. Right. Um, and that's when, that's when the, there is this uh, denial of a patristic doctrine. That that's that is right. in the is in the fathers. That that that's when we can't go there because we know that the fathers do confess, as you just said from Saint Cyril, um, in in a great um, text there. Um, do you think? And I'm going to get some. There's we got one audience question so far here. Um, do you think that Florence is sufficient to resolve this? Um, this whole doctrinal dispute. I, I we have uh, my Ukrainian Catholic friend Lyndon Preddy. Um, he notes that the Ukrainian Greek Catholic Church originally, they actually added the filioque into their Greek creed. And then later in the 90s, after the Soviet regime fell, they decided to take it out, just, just sort of try to be ecumenical with the, with the Ukrainian Orthodox. Right. Um, 
So do you think that Florence as a doctrinal council is sufficient to resolve this issue? Or do you think there needs to be further doctrinal clarification? Yeah, I, I don't. I think that any further doctrinal clarification is going to be breaking our nails out the bottom of the barrel. I mean, I think that we've done all of the concessions that we can. I think we've looked at all the fathers on this matter. I know that uh, Ed Sachensky, um, you know, his position is that Maximus's position hasn't really been examined thoroughly. I happen to take a different view. Um, I don't have the credentials to really compete with him. But in my humble opinion, I think that Maximus doesn't really resolve anything for us because you can be a Neopalamite and use that letter to Marinus. You can be a monopratris fundamentalist Photian and use that letter to Marinus. And you could be a Latin filioquist, Thomistic, Scotistic, you know, Catholic and use the letter to uh, Marinus. So I, I don't think Marinus actually bakes any bread, that, that letter to Marinus uh, bakes any bread for us. I think, I think the, what you read, that summary from Florence, that's about the only way I can think of metaphysically and physically um, to reconcile the Latin doctrine and the Greek doctrine. Um, anything, if we're, if, we're, if we're trying to dig further down, we're going to hit the, the lava at the core of the earth. Yes, I, I would agree. I, and, that, and this ultimately, because I think there's been a lot of good that has come out of the East-West ecumenical dialogue. Not, I don't think the same can be said about Catholic and Protestant dialogue. I don't think that's very, very fruitful, but I do think that East and West has done some good things. They've produced, produced a few good documents trying to resolve various things, but there also does seem to be lamentably somewhat of a, uh, an exclusion of Eastern Catholics, and which I think is a great shame because Eastern Catholics have chosen since Florence and after they've chosen to enter into communion with the Holy See on the basis of Florence, and they've suffered for it immensely, some with their blood. Uh, and they've done this because they believe, one, that there's no salvation outside the church, and that, two, that they need to have charity with their Latin brethren, and then that we will we look at Florence, and despite any shenanigans that happens at all ecumenical councils, because there's always shenanigans going on and evil people and whatnot, we see in the decrees that there is this resolution, that there is a certain amount of charitable dialogue that did take place, that there was a resolution, and that this is this is something that Eastern Catholics have chosen to confess and suffer for it. And so I, I, I lament the fact that Eastern Catholics are not given their place at the table in this East-West dialogue. Um, and that's very unfortunate. Any, any comments on that? Yeah, no, I, I, I think that, that that's absolutely correct, um, that uh, this, this is a, an unnecessary contention, um, and, and we've, we've gone so far to accommodate the Orthodox sensibilities on, on their fear of the, you know, the homo hypostasis that Photius and Palamas accused the Latins of, and also the subordination of the Holy Spirit out of the Godhead. Both of those main objections have been answered. Yes, I, and I think that the answers... Uh, so, I mean, I don't think that removing the filioque doesn't it good. I, I mean, it's already been answered. We believe it, it's already been dogmatized. Even if they did remove the filioque sort of canonically it wouldn't right. change the fact that it's been dogmatized. So right. that wouldn't satisfy the Orthodox. No. Um, the only thing that would really satisfy the hardcore Orthodox would be if Florence was abrogated, and that's impossible because it's been yes. dogmatized. So. Right, uh, annulment. They would need right. the annul annul annulment of Florence, yeah. I want to get a few uh, questions here. Balder Bra says, what's the real-life consequences of believing or disbelieving in the filioque? What impact does the doctrine have on the life of the church on an individual Catholic? Great question. That is really the question because if there's no relevance, then we're just in a speculative echo chamber that's useless and uh, harmful to charity. So what? why is this so important? What, what are your thoughts, Eric? 
Well, I, I think that, um, you know, it, it has an, it has, first and foremost, it has a theological importance. In other words, um, the scholastics in the Latin West, they believed that it was important to uphold the filioque in order to maintain a, a coherent Trinitarian doctrine. So for them, if you have, if you don't have the filioque, then the result that comes from that is that you 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 would basically have a a homo hypostasis of the spirit and the son, because there would be no way to distinguish um, the spirit and the son from each other. But that's another theological, you know, uh, nuts and bolts uh, matter. How does this relate practically to us as a praying people? Well, I think that the Spanish theologians. You know, they were they wanted to uphold the deity of the Son, but also the deity of the Holy Spirit, because if the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son, then and the Son is God, then the Spirit has to be God. And and with that, the Holy Spirit proceeding from the Son and the Father um, is just a further establishment of the deity of the Spirit as well. And and how this applies to us practically, um, it is a difficult question for me to ask because I've actually not meditated on it that much. I've only been, uh, my investment has almost exclusively been on the historical and the theological significance. Um, so I'll have to be honest with the questioner that, you know, I am probably not the best one to answer this question. So please, um, if you find someone adequate to answer, I would love to hear a better one than I gave. Well, actually, I <laughs> let me let me read from my favorite text, the Imitation of Christ, because it says this: um, the very first chapter. What doth it avail thee to discourse profoundly on the Trinity if thou be void of humility and consequently displeasing to the Trinity? In truth, sublime words make not a man holy and just, but a virtuous life maketh him dear to God. Um, the fathers, um, the fathers used Greek philosophy. They utilized the tools that they had from their classical training to philosophically defend the divine revelation of the most holy trinity and to present to the church some coherent picture of the mystery it's a coherent that's what orthodoxy is it's right worship it's just the co correct and most coherent picture in order to pray and worship the mystery and at a certain point the the exact i mean we're, we're talking about just the basic doctrine of the trinity one god and three persons is already a paradox and a mystery itself and so there are limits to how far we can go to try to make the mystery coherent. But the whole purpose of everything is to have communion with one God and three divine persons. And so all of these different terms are a means to that end. And so if it's not serving that end, what end is it really serving? Um, and so, I think that that this is a challenge. To me, this this is this question is a challenge to the orthodox side, the the anti filioquist side, because um, the Latins were just going on about their life, and you know they were just doing their uh, doing their their Catholic life. Now they came over to the east and they said, "Wait, why did you remove the filioque?" Uh, so then it's on them to to then prove to the Greeks if they don't have a filioque, then you can't pray. And then the Greeks have to prove to the West, if you don't have, a, or if you add the filioque, then you can't pray to the Holy Trinity. Um, but I think that the, really, when, when this debate gets so heated, we forget that the whole purpose of this is to have communion with three divine persons. And so I think that we lose touch of that and we start to just get into this speculative echo chamber um, that is just this philosophical debate that is not even actually trying to get to the whole purpose of that. So I, I think that Florence succeeded in that because it looked at the fathers and said, 
we're all meaning the same thing. We're all going towards the same divine coherent mystery, if that can be even said. It's a paradox, paradoxical phrase, coherent mystery, uh, rational mystery, if you will. Um, but once we have those basics of the rational mystery, then we can pray. And so I think at a certain point, we need to just dogmatize the mystery, keep the mystery a mystery. Uh, the her heretics want to take out part of the mystery to make it more sensible and more rational. And at some point, we need to just dogmatize the mystery and pray and worship. Those are my thoughts. What do you think, Eric? Excellent. Excellent, brother. Thank you so much. That was very, very encouraging. Um, let's see. We've got 101 says, if I recall correctly, I've seen claims that the filioque was later added to the manuscripts of Spanish documents, I guess from Toledo. What are your thoughts? If true, would that hurt the filioquist position? Go ahead. Yeah. Um, so yes, there are, there are some contemporary uh, historians. It actually goes, it's been around for a little bit, um, where some, some scholars don't believe that um, King Ricard at the Council of Toledo 589 added the filioque to the creed. Um, so what has to be remembered here is at the Council of Toledo, you've got a recitation of the Nicene Constantinopolitan Creed, and then you've also got Ricard's Confession of Faith because he was an Arian king of the Visigoth, Visigothic Arian king who converted to Catholicism. So he gave a confession of faith in one part of the council that is in the minutes of the council, and then you've got later on a, a, a recitation of the creed. In both areas, his confession of faith and the creed, you have the filioque. So even if, and I'm going out here on a limb, even if a historian wants to push the fact that the filioque was added to that document of the Acts of 589 later, you still have the confession of faith of the king, which I don't know anybody who disputes the 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 um the accuracy of King Ricard's confession. And then you also have St. Saint, Saint Isidore of Seville that writes about this, the, the, the whole scenario. So was St. Isidore wrong? I don't think he was wrong. I've actually talked with some, um, I've actually contacted some scholars of the, of, the, of the Latin Mediterranean world at this time, the theologians on this matter. And they, you know, they said, look, there's a new little fuzzy wuzzy that theologians are entertaining today, and that's that the filioque was somehow, you know, they went out and they went back and added it all into the documents. Um, the evidence of that is rather poor, um, and the the highest probability is on the side that um, that definitely was at least in his confession of faith at that council. I'm of the opinion that it was at the, it was it was the, the creed was cited with the filioque in 589 because of Saint Isidore's testimony on the matter. Yeah, and to me, I like like we tried to present here. There's kind of these the whole Roman Empire and the and the extents uh, the north northern areas, the western end in Spain, the eastern end all the way into Persian Empire. Um, there, all of these areas are developing certain filioquist doctrines save only for certain Cappadocian fathers. And that's fine. That's fine. You know, if they, but they're basically innovating certain terms to achieve the same ends. Right. As we said. So and it, all yeah. of these, yeah, they're just creating these different terms to, to, to safeguard the mystery, to pass down the deposit of faith. And it doesn't hurt the filioque either because, um, Nobody disputes the filioque and the writings of Augustine um, and of the writings of like Pope Leo the Great, Gregory right. the Great, Isidore, Leander, um, Theodore of Tarsus. You've got so many documents where where nobody disputes their authenticity. So even if you were to clean off the Spanish documents, you still have got a plethora of filioquist documents right. in the West. Right. That, that's a really good point. I mean, you just you basically have this Latin patristic tradition. And then you've also, as I said, the Syriac patristic tradition in the, in the Cyrillian, Cyrillian, the Alexandrian. But the, really, the filioquist phrase is far more Latin. Um, so you yes. have all you have Augustine, you have Ambrose, and you basically have to either throw out Ambrose, throw out Augustine, or you need to somehow try to find a way that 
when Augustine said the spirit proceeds from the father and the son, he actually means the spirit proceeds from the father only, um, <laughs> which people, some people have tried to do that. Um, real quick side note, Bjorn is asking what's the best imitation of Christ. This is the one I like imitation of Christ. It's the confraternity of the precious blood version. It's a pocket version. So you can carry it around. I, I, I love this text. My wife bought, bought it for me years ago before we were, uh, before we were married. It's, it's just an awesome text. So imitation of Christ, um, side note, that's the one I always challenge Eastern Orthodox to read because they think that post 1054, we went off the deep end spiritually. Well, if you think that we went off the deep end spiritually, read this text. This is, uh, one of the most fundamental widespread Western spiritual texts, uh, started in the 1300s ever. So if you think that we're the Western Latins are filled with prelast or whatever, read this text. It was actually a bestseller in Russia, believe it or not. Um, I wanted to, I wanted to mention one objection and that is Leo the third or so Leo the third, not Leo the 13th, Leo the third, um, in response to the, the controversy about the filioque that breaks out with Charlemagne, uh, he makes two, I don't know if it's gold or bronze, but you know, the, he makes the, um, these plates in Rome that have the non filioque Latin creed and, and also in Greek um, to sort of appease the East. But at the same time, he does not condemn. He, he tells the Franks to take out the filioque, but then um, he doesn't actually condemn it as heresy. He's trying to maintain a certain unity with the emperor in the East and the emperor in the West. Actually, I think it's the Empress at this time, but the imperial power in the East, the imperial power in the West. Um, but then the uh, and I've, I've heard there are there is some scholarship that claims John the Eighth as well does this later in the Photian Council, the ninth century. And they said and the Pope also sort of affirms that we're not going to do the filioque. But then there's this reversal in uh, in the 11th century, which is where the Latin filioque is confessed in the Roman liturgy in Rome. Um, and the context of that is that the papacy was in a period of great decadence. It's called by historians, the pornocracy. That's, it's how bad it was in the Vatican at this time. This is the nine hundreds and into the 11th century. Uh, there was such cor corruption in the Vatican. Uh, John the 12th was, uh, the Romans called upon the Roman emperor of the West to come and depose the Pope. Uh, and there was this big dispute over the papacy and eventually, a reforming party gained the papacy, which is known as the Cluniac monks. This is in the 11th century. And they needed the support of the imperial power of the West to basically kind of bring in his soldiers so that they can take care of business and kick out all these corrupt clerics. Right now we have a problem with, with bad clerics. We've got clerical abuse. Well, at that time they had the same problem, clerical sodomy, all sorts of nastiness happening. St. Peter Damien wrote a book about it. It's awful. Um, so they were actually using the imperial power. Well, the imperial power had a filioque creed. So when the filio, when the imperial power came in and said, why aren't you doing, we're trying to, you know, help you with this papacy cleanup. Why aren't you doing the filioque and the creed? So at that time, the papacy said, okay, fine, we're just going to do this. And they probably didn't even think twice. Uh, they probably for, didn't even think twice about all these Eastern concerns that have sort of been laid to rest for two centuries. They were probably mostly concerned about the fact that every other cleric is deeply corrupt and we need to like kick them out. We need the imperial power to help us. So this is the problem with this situation is that it arises when the West is really trying to clamp down on corruption, take out a bunch of bad actors in the West. And it just so happens that a filioque gets dropped into the Roman liturgy at the time. And so there's all these things happening in the West, which causes them to reverse a former stance 200 years ago. So, that's the, I mean, like we kind of conceded in the beginning, hey, like I, I wish that would have happened for the Greeks sake, but I understand why they started doing it in the West in the 11th century with the situation they were dealing with. Eric, any thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I think that uh, it's an often forgotten aspect of the, con you know, the context. Um, and, um, you know, the, the, there was, you know, Rome was not a fan of putting the filioque in the creed um, in the uh, 8th and 9th century. Um, but it, they were ardent defenders of the theology of the filioque. Yeah, here's, um, uh, this is Leo III. He defends right. the filioque in Epistle 15. 
That's his letter to the Easterners. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. So these are the different historical depths that we need to get into. Um, I think that bottom line is for Catholics, if you are tempted to believe in any of these polemics or whatever, you know, you have to study this for years. Unfortunately, it's, it's like a, a number of years for you to go through all the sources and all the arguments and get through it. And luckily we have an eight year study written right here <laughs> by Eric. So if you want a, a shortcut, you can go to Eric's book and uh, start to dig into this if you really want to, if you're tempted and you feel like maybe Eastern Orthodox really is the true church. Um, it is a many long year process to try to wade through everything. But I think the the, the main point that I'm, I want to make in this video is that it's a lot more complicated than a lot of people say it is. That's Any true. final thoughts for us, Eric, on your book? No, I just I appreciate you, uh, you know, putting it up there. It, it is a, it, it is written for somebody who is completely new to this. Um, but, I, you know, some of the books that I cite in the first the first part of the introduction and the first chapter, there's two primers that uh, I, I cite from. Um, if you're if you're a little lost already at the beginning, you can go pick up those two primers. They're very tiny, thin books. Um but yes, I go through the basics of Trinitarian structuring from the Latin and the Greek side. So I try to go back to foundations and build up to the filioque way. And then chapter four, which is by far the longest chapter in the book, is basically a massive florilegium of patristic texts. I, I've not seen one compiled this big before. So I think there's immense value to be gained um, from it just for that reason excellent yes thank you so much eric uh so i want to direct everyone to the show notes below this video so right here you can buy uh ibarra's book right here at this link and then if you want to go deeper we also have links to all sorts of other resources both written and video to go deeper into this centuries-long controversy that we pray and hope will be resolved as soon as possible, at least in the individual members um, of, of uh, Eastern Orthodoxy. So, Eric, thank you so much for your contribution to this debate. Um, I've got another uh, important message from my daughter coming, it sounds like. No, maybe <laughs> not. Okay, um, so before we lose, <laughs> lose this uh, moment... Let's offer up a Hail Mary to Our Lady. This is the uh, icon of Our Lady of Fatima, which we've been promoting. This is the icon written by a Russian Orthodox Christian. And we, we promote this icon as a means of uh, unity with our separated brethren, Eastern Orthodox, asking Our Lady to help to intercede and obtain the grace that we need to resolve this. Um, I might have, maybe. Rosemary, come here, sweetheart. What's the matter? Oh, okay. <laughs> All right, let's let's pray. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. Blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Jesus is King. Amen. <laughs>